Without faith, nothing can be accomplished. And without faith, God cannot be pleased with us. Faith is a fight. And faith is a challenge. And many times, because it is, it is easier to lay back and not challenge ourselves about anything. It's easier for us to lay back and not challenge ourselves in faith. A vision is when you have a snapshot, not just an imagination in your mind. You have a picture in your mind of what you want to be able to accomplish. And it's there in your heart. And when it's there in your heart and in your mind, you have sat down and also added to it some goals. If you want to energize your vision, you have to put dates on your vision. I want to um, talk about the ingredients of a life of faith. Some of the catalysts that make our faith produce results quicker. A catalyst is that one chemical that you throw in another, in, in compounds and where there is a chemical reaction and they produce the same results but they will cause it to be faster. Faith has catalysts. You study the word of God, you'll see some people's faith produce results. All faith produces results but some people's faith is on fire. Some people's faith uh, produces quick results and some faith is almost looks like dead. It takes a long time. And this morning, I just want to talk about uh, some of the things that we need to look at about faith. Hebrews chapter 11, if you go there, Hebrews chapter 11, I will uh, read a verse there that talks about faith. The Bible says, uh, by faith we understand that universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. What is seen was not made out of what is visible. And the Bible talks about God created the heavens and the earth by faith. He had, he had the ability, he had the power like he still has, but he used faith to create. And since we are children of God, that seems to be the tool God has given us to be able to create things and to be able to move forward if I can use the word create in that sense. And I want it understood in that sense. If we are going to have things that are functional, things that are happening in our lives, if we are going to see reaction results, we have to use faith and we have to use a faith that produces results. And without faith, the Bible says it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he is and that also he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 the Bible talks about a faith that believes that God is, that God exists, that there is a God. There's no question in your heart that there is a God. And not just that there is a God like everyone believes, even the devil believes, but you also believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith is, is the, the, the function of our spirits and our hearts that produces results that is put there by God and it's actually put there so that it can make us and help us overcome. Ingredients of a life of faith. Faith is essential for us to be pleasing to God. Without God, without faith, nothing can be accomplished and without faith, God cannot be pleased with us. When God is pleased with us, that is when he produces and gives us the things that we ask for. And without faith, God is not happy. God rejoices when he sees faith. God laughs and joys, is happy when he sees somebody that is saying, I believe, God, you can do this. The Bible is saying that it is impossible to make him smile. It is impossible to make his heart joyous unless you are stretching and challenging and believing that he can do something for your life. In our human thinking, we think that when we are stretching our faith, we are disturbing God but in his thinking, he says, when you are stretching your faith, you make me rejoice. When you are stretching your faith, you cause me to be happy. God is pleased when we as human beings stretch our faith and ask him to do things uh, in our lives. God began creation by faith. There is no Christianity without faith. There is no earth without faith. There is no creation without faith. Faith is everything about a Christian. We have to have faith. Without it, it's impossible to please God. And I found that we are so easily embracing a Christianity in our time and in our world that is uh, devoid of power, that has no power whatsoever, 
that does not uh, challenge God, well, all the patriarchs and all the early church, the whole book of Acts is a book of faith. These are the acts of the apostles, but they are also the acts of the Holy Spirit. They are also the acts of faith. This book can be called any of those three names. These are the acts of faith and the church that was there in the book of Acts. It's very different from this church. It's very different from our today's church because our church is able to live life without faith. It is impossible to please God without faith, the Bible says. Amen. And so this, this morning, I just want to uh, lift up a few things that are essentials of the faith. I, I, I want to say something about uh, faith that I know that will impact your lives and will challenge you. I don't want to preach uh, to you this morning. I am praying for results in your life. I'm praying for something that is going to be stirred within that will cause you to think about faith in a different way. And also wake up some faith giants that are among us and remind you that this thing moves forward in faith. These things are accomplished by faith. Life is going to be a... You are going to have victory by faith. It's not by cruising through life. I'll, I'll share my own testimony about the, the, my life with faith and how I have seen faith works. I always find it easier in my own life to cruise and not to just challenge myself. So I'll do one whole month or three months being challenged, moving in faith, but I'll sit back sometimes and my spirit will say something like, man, you need something more stable. You, you don't need to believe and because this is not very uncertain. That is my mind and my spirit saying. So you need to set up systems that are more stable. And I'll set up the systems and I'll start closing on and on and on. And I, I find that life to be boring. I find that life not accomplishing the desire of God. Though it may be calming to my spirit, I, de- I, I find that I'm not doing anything with my life when I don't stretch my faith to accomplish something in my life. And so I have discovered that faith is a fight and faith is a challenge. And many times, because it is, it is easier to lay back and not challenge ourselves about anything. It's easier for us to lay back and not challenge ourselves in faith. And so I want to challenge you this morning. It is faith that will lift lift you from where you are and bring you to the next level. It is faith. It is faith that will conquer your current challenges and bring you to where you want to be. It is faith. It is not anything else. It is not the desires of your heart. It is not the commendations of people. It is not the environment. It is not the coming of snow. It is not the coming of fall. It is not the coming of these seasons. It is when you grab a season of faith in your life. And you start saying, I know God has something better. I am not, I'm not saying that he has not done great things, but I know he has greater things for me. And you start walking in that faith and challenging yourself. That is when you start seeing great things in your life. Amen. Don't you find it easier? Instead of going back to school, to just pick more hours at work. Isn't it? Instead of believing God to get you into a school and pursuing a career, it's easier to just pick up more hours. That's what I'm talking about, closing. And don't qu- get quiet on me. You are so quiet. But I have to deliver this message. You, you know what? This morning, I will bring it home. By God's grace. I'm speaking faith. I will bring it home until we live a life of faith because I have a conviction fresh conviction in my heart that it is faith that will take you from where you are to the next level. If I can challenge you from prayerlessness to being a prayerful person, from faithlessness to being a faith person, I know it is going to be a big difference in your life. It is more than when I call you forward and lay hands on you. It is when you know how to get from where you are so that when you get stuck next time, you'll be able to challenge yourself to the next level. It is impossible for anyone to please God without faith. So if I'm not walking in faith, if I'm not having these ingredients that I'm going to be talking about here today, then I want you to understand that if I'm not walking in those, then I am not probably 
very pleasing to God and I'm not going to be victorious in the things uh, that I desire. It is the faith that overcomes the world. It is faith that overcomes the world. I'll give you three things this morning that are practical things. Practical things that are actually supposed to, accomp uh, to accompany your faith so that you can be victorious. Three things that will activate your faith. Three catalysts that will activate your faith. Number one is vision. 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 Vision is what is going to activate your faith. These are not complicated things, and so probably writing just one line will be helpful, but they are not complicated, and I don't want anything complicated this morning. Simple stuff, simple stuff that you can apply today or tomorrow. Number one, vision. Can you say vision? Vision. Vision. Having a vision in your life will make you, that is faithless or prayerless, to become a person of prayer, having a vision. If I ask all of you, anyone with a vision, raise up your hand, you raise up your hands. That is not counted lying, but I know that many of you think you have a vision, but you don't. When you meet a person with a vision, you know. Something about them is electric. They are energized. They are fired up. You don't live with a vision without results. It's so natural for vision to produce results like it is so natural when rain falls to see weeds and all kinds of things coming up from the ground. It is so natural. The problem is that the devil has a way of confusing us using the same words but have different meanings. Vision is what each one of us needs in their faith for our faith to produce results. Vision. What is the vision that you have for your life? If you have already accomplished all your visions, you have started dying. Regardless of how old you are, 75 year old man, his name is Abraham. He is spoken to by God. When you're 75, you're winding up. When you're 75, what are you doing? You are just wanting to bless people. You are just spitting on your chest in those olden days. You're telling people that I want you to take that piece of land there. I mean, you're winding up in life. The word of God comes and produces a vision in the life of Abraham. He hears God. Genesis chapter 12, beginning from verse 1 to 9, God says, I want you to arise, move away from these people that you are used to, move away from your kindred and your type, because these are your people now, and I want you to go to another land where I will show you. Another people, another surrounding, new friends, a new level. A new environment, a new horizon. When you wake up, you see new, different challenges. You go against a different kind of mountain. The terrain is different. I want you to move. Move in your mind, move in your heart. I want you to go to another place. That is a vision that was actually created in the mind of Abraham. So from this day forward, Abraham is packing up and he's just imagining it is not going to be all of the Chaldeans. It is going to be a different... He's imagining milk and honey. He's looking at all these things and he's saying, Man, I am going to go to that land and my nation, my children are going to be there in that land. You have to move from your kindred, Abraham, and I'll take you to a new land. God created a vision in Abraham and a 75-year-old man becomes a star in the Bible and is called the father of faith. This morning, however young or old you are, whoever is listening to me, I want you to know that that is a snapshot that you need in your life. And once you get that snapshot, when, once you get something in your mind and in your heart, a vision created, and you energize your life to achieving it, then you are going to have, be a person of faith and it's going to be natural. You don't have to go to a conference of faith. You, have to, you don't have to go to seminars of faith. Once you have a vision and you hold on to that vision, and you refuse to let go, then I know that naturally you live a life of faith. Do you have a vision for your life? Now, when I sit down to do vision for this church, and set goals, I have to go to different departments. I have goals for salvation of souls. I have goals for baptisms. I have goals for money. I have goals for all these things, because ministry encompasses a lot of things. And so that causes me to actually set goals in all these different departments. 
You are not going to just say, I have a vision because I'm, I have a vision to get rich. That's not a vision. That is a dream. That's a wish. And if wishes were horses, even beggars would be riding them. That's a wish that will never be accomplished. Those are things that everybody has. Each one of us has a dream that will never ever be accomplished because you have not turned it into a goal that is accomplishable. So vision is when you have a snapshot, not just an imagination in your mind. You have a picture in your mind of what you want to be able to accomplish and it's there in your heart. And when it's there in your heart and in your mind, you have sat down and also added to it some goals. If you want to energize your vision, you have to put dates on your vision. You have to have dates on it. If your vision has no dates, it's just a dream. You have to have dates on those visions. I have, for example, let's say your vision is, I'm going to be in the next uh, five years or in the next two and a half years, I'm going to have accomplished A, B, and C. I want to have saved $10,000 in, in terms of money. So I have said that, not in the next two, three, two and a half years, because next year I'll be saying two and a half years. I have to say that in 2005, in the month of June, at the end, I'll have saved 10000 And then you start from there and walk backwards to today. And say, if I'll have 10000 on that on that day, then it means that by the end of next year, or by the end of next year, I'll have 5000 in the bank. How do you, I say that I'm going to Atlanta, I wake up, uh, I want to be there by tomorrow this time, but I wake up and find myself still, you know, later tomorrow morning and I'm still dreaming of being in Atlanta. I have at least to see myself in St. Louis after some hours. So when you have debts, it helps you be able to mark out your, your, your different goals. And now you can say, after a month I'll have this. And so what I need to do is A, B, C, D. These are my steps to be able to accomplish that. So vision is not complicated. Vision is when you have a clear understanding of what God wants you to accomplish. When you set dates on it, you have put fire. It's ignited and you're going to get results out of it. Amen? And so this is, a, this is very important. Habakkuk also, uh, in Habakkuk 2, the Bible says that uh, for your vision to be um, accomplished, it has to be written down, it has to be clear. And uh, the Bible, I'll read you what the scriptures say. The Bible says, then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation. Write down this vision. And make it plain on tablets. That is, write it down in a place. Make it plain on tablets. And this may be to, to today's tablet. Make it plain on your iPad. Make it plain on a tablet. In those days when they say tablet, they meant stones. He says, make it plain on tablets. And so that the one who sees it may also be able to run with it. So that if you read it every day, not somebody else, if you read it every day, you'll be able to run with it. It is so clear that even if you died, somebody else can accomplish it. Walt Disney, the person who built uh, Disneyland, that man set out a vision and died. And he wrote up everything and he died. And on the day it was being opened, someone spoke to his wife and said, I wish Walt Disney was here to see this. And the wife quickly replied, he saw it, that's why it's here. He had seen it in the beginning, that's why it was drawn, that's why it was raised money for, that why, that's why it was projected, and that's why it exists, because somebody saw it in the beginning. You have to have this picture in your mind, you have to have dates put on it, and when you do that, God sees that as a challenge, and God will explode on your situation to make sure that that is accomplished. When you challenge God and you say, Father, I know you can do this, you know what happens? God will come down and will do it. Our African fathers, many of them know that when a child talks about their father, they are very proud. Ch children, we used to challenge each other in school. I don't know whether it happens here, but we used to challenge each other in school that your father can beat, my father can beat your father. Okay. I think that was pushing it. But sometimes, we used to even talk about, my father is richer than your father. My father has a car. I, I remember one of my brothers telling some people that uh, our father can fly the car he, he drives. He can fly it. 
And they were, they laughed and they said, no, 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 you drink some water, you are lying. And I, but we, we were really proud of our fathers. And uh, this is what I also know. When fathers knew what you were saying they would do, if my father had me say that he can lift 100 pounds, even if he's not a very strong man, he'll lift it because my son believes I can do it. It's the same principle. God wants us to challenge him and tell everybody and tell the world how much he can do, what he can accomplish for our lives. And when we say that, and when we are proud of our father, he is happy with us, and he comes down and accomplishes those things for us in our lives. And so we need to be able to have a vision that is clear, a vision that we are talking about, a vision that we can write down, a vision that we can confess and let people know what our God can do. Why is it important to write it on tablets? Why is it important to write it down? It's because vision leaks. There is leakage of vision. You can have an imagination today. You are fired up after today's service. But after a week from now, you cannot even remember what fired you up. That's why you have to write it down. The Bible says, write it on tablets so that you can see it all the time. So that you will remember it will stay before your eyes. The devil will make sure that what you have seen doesn't stay before you. And that's why you have to challenge yourself. Sit down and write down what it is that you are believing God for. If you are new in this way of faith, I want you to start with baby steps. Don't start with big. Because some people, when you write down your visions, you write big things. And then when you don't accomplish them, you think it doesn't work. It needs the building of muscle. It has to be you are bear and lion before you meet your Goliath. You have to have the steps. You have to have one step, one, the next level, the next level. Don't imagine that you're going to save a million if you have never saved a hundred. Begin with a hundred. And then have another goal of a thousand. Have another goal of ten thousand. And then from there you can build and have mega faith. But before you start taking, taking big steps, begin your faith with small steps. And those steps are going to make, an make you accomplish great things in your life. Amen? If you give me more juice here, I think I'll not uh, struggle as much. Thank you. Oh, that's good. That's, that's good. Amen. So th this is where I want you to um, always uh, put your focus on. Faith leaks. And so you need to, as you think about faith, you need to make sure that you are keeping that image before you. I've had people who take pictures. I've had people who take those uh, things, those visions, and put them on a mirror where they actually comb their hair every day. That would be very he helpful for ladies especially. Well, if you write down what you are trusting God for and put it by your mirror and see it every day, great things are going to happen. One of the challenges that I want you to take today, this morning, is I want you to write down your vision for the next, I know you have a vision for five years, but I want you to take a vision for the next five months. For the next five months. It's hard to make an, a great accomplishment in a month or two. Take a chunk of five months and say, in the next five months, I am going to accomplish one, two, three, four, and five. And when we leave this service, I'm also going to go and do the same and I want us to write five things that we are going to accomplish in the next five months. Five things I'm going to do in the next five months. And if you visit my house within the next five months, you are going to find that in a mirror. And one on the left side will be mine. On the right side will be my wife's. And we are going to do this so that we can see something practical. I want us to learn something practical about faith. Faith is not dormant. Faith works. Faith works. Many of us don't know how to work it. And that's why I used to read books called Mathematic Arithmetic Made Easy by Patel or somebody. This is Faith Made Easy by the Bible. It is so easy. It is written for us that make sure you have a goal. Make sure that the goal that you have can be remembered. Make sure that the goal you have can be seen by others. Make sure that that goal is something that can be accomplished. Have a goal in your life. Make sure that that goal is written down. Make sure that that goal is something that, is, uh, that can be accomplished. And then trust God 
that he's going to do it. The other thing I want you to do is when you have those pictures of your goal. For example, if your goal for the next five months is to purchase a TV, go get a picture of it. It will be helpful. Go get a picture of it and put it somewhere. And see it every day. So that when you next time go to buy a dress, and the dress is 150, the picture will be in your mind, and it will speak to you. It, when you have bought a dress, and you already come with it to the house, and you see the picture, you will return it. So this is not one of my goals. This is one of those foolish things that we do when we go shopping. You are trying to save the store. You are trying to save J.C. Penny. You heard they are going down and it's been faithful to you so you want to bring it up. Some people want to help Obama by improving the economy single-heartedly. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. Have goals. If you don't have goals for your life, all what you have will go to people that have goals in their lives. Because these big stores have goals for customers. They have targets. You are one of their targets. I mean, you are on their cross. I mean, they have actually made sure that you are right there. Bullseye, they will get you. So if you don't have a goal, they have a bullseye on your check and they'll get a chunk of it. Make sure you tell your money where to go instead of wondering afterwards where your money went. If you don't have a goal, you don't tell it where it's going. If you don't have a goal, it will actually disappear on you and you start wondering, how come my check of so many hundred dollars, it has, it's not in the house? And you start looking at your wife suspiciously or your husband suspiciously, and yet they didn't do anything. It's just that you don't know the principles of life. Have a goal for everything that you do in your life. Amen? And when you set goals for your life, I mean, those goals, God is going to accomplish them and God is going to do it so that he can give you uh, great grace. Some of you cannot hear anything that I'm saying uh, except if I talk about health because a lot of us really are inundated by all the media coverage on health issues and products. And um, so I'll say something about it also. What is a snapshot that you need to take? Do you need to ask somebody to make you a 150 pound person? Just go back to your old pictures and put one of them on the mirror. And just have it there and say, I will get back here because one day I was back there. So that's a snapshot. It will take you back to where you actually uh, came from. Amen? So have a goal in your life. How many are going to do that? You're going to write down goals in your life and they are going to energize you. Somebody is saying, uh, I don't think that works. Tell me something else that works. I'll take it any day. This word has been tested seven times before it was given to us. It works. If you think that those are principles of the world, I want you to know they borrowed it from the scriptures. Every one of them. It's not an original thought. They can encode it in books. They can put copyrights on it. It is copyrighted by God in the Bible. He's the only one that owns the original. He knows that's how he created the earth. He gave himself seven days. And he said, the first day I'm going to create this. I can create all of them in six days. God could have created all these things in six days, in one day. But he said, okay, first day, I'll do this. Second day, I'll do this. But again, if you look at the process of creation, you'll see he had thought through it. Nothing, man does not come before the removal of water. Man does not show up before. Man comes up when everything is ready. That is when he creates man on the sixth day and then after that he rested. He created the environment. He put the oxygen in place. He put the vegetation in place because when man wakes up, he has to have lunch, um, a fruit salad. And so he had everything prepared. Then he brought man to the scene. He had planned himself. He had a goal to accomplish in six days. And so he did it in those days. What is the goal that you have for your life? In fact, even the Bible says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. So if God needs a plan, how much more? We need plans for planning. We need more plans in our lives if God needs a plan. Amen? And so goals, vision is a 
Vision, no, goals are a vision with dates. And having dates on your vision will make you be able to accomplish them. Number two, igniter of faith is prayer. Having a prayer life that looks towards the things that you are trusting God for. Many of us think that things will just happen in your life just because you have written them down. That doesn't just happen. If you have faith, if you have faith, then you will pray about those things. When you write down that by this time, God will have done this for me. I'm trusting God to do this for me. What you do is from that day, every single day, every single chance you have, you kneel down and talk to God about your goal and about your vision. The Bible talks about the power of darkness in several places. But in one place, he says, you cannot plunder a strong man. When he guards his goods, they are safe. But if a stronger man comes and disarms him and ties him and holds him to the ground, you are able to take his plunder. The many, many times we fail is because we do not understand we are confronting the powers of darkness. And they are not confronted by positive thinking. They are not confronted by just having good things written on a piece of paper. They are confronted by you knowing how to pray, knowing how to talk to God, and praying the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith is not crying. The prayer of faith is declaring what God has written. And it's coming to God and saying, see what you have said in your word. Can you accomplish and honor this? And because of his integrity, God is going to honor what he has spoken in his word. Amen? And so this is something that is important. We have to become people of prayer if our faith is going to produce results. The Bible says that even one among you is sick, let him call the elders and let the elders anointing with oil and the prayer of faith is going to heal that person. It is a prayer of faith, not just the oil, not just the laying on of hands. It is a prayer of faith that produces results that we can call miracles. God has taught us in the scriptures the importance and the power of prayer. Jesus lived his life in prayer. Before he chose the 12, he spent the whole night in prayer. Before he fed the 5,000, he spent a long time in prayer. Every time he went to prayer, something great happened. One evening, he sent the disciples to go across on the other side. And as they were sailing along, he actually followed them walking on water after praying. It is prayer that produces results. It is the time of fasting and the time of denying yourself that makes you come back not anointed with the Holy Spirit only, but anointed with the Spirit and with power. And that is what you need to release about the visions and the goals that you have. You have to release the power that is only released in prayer. Amen? Let me show you a scripture in the book of Luke, chapter 18, from verse 1. Then he spoke a parable and, uh, to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Men always ought to pray and not give up. Men always ought to pray and not give up. Men always ought to pray and not give up. That means when you stop praying, you have given up. Are you praying about some things in your life? Or have you given up on them? Some of you are trusting God for a breakthrough in, uh, in, in, in papers, a breakthrough in finances, a breakthrough in this area. And you have stopped praying. That means you have given up. And Jesus is giving a parable saying you need to continue praying until you see results. There are some sticklers, people that will keep there and will stay there and immovable and their unbreakable faith is going to produce results. But some people are broken so quickly when God doesn't show up tomorrow how the evangelist told me that in 24 hours God is going to do a miracle and it, it doesn't happen. We give up. The Bible says we always ought to continue in prayer and not give up. And so he says, saying, there was a certain city, in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said to him within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continue coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and God shall... 
And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? He's talking about faith. He gives a simple parable. He says this woman here is a woman of faith. This woman kept coming to the judge every morning. Judge looks at this woman the first day, says, Mama, show, show, you know what you do? Go, go, you go home, and uh, we'll take care of things. He thinks this is just like one of the other go-go's. You give her some sugar. She goes home. She's not coming back. Next morning, go-go is there, just walking and saying, you have to avenge me. And she's there and saying, you have to avenge me. He starts sneaking on this woman. Says, okay, get my car to the other side, get my horse to the other side. He runs away. Then he goes like this for a month. Go, go comes every morning. She doesn't listen to the watchman. The watchman says, you cannot see him. And she points the her stick on the watchman and says, I will see him and I'll get what I need. Jesus is using an example with just day-to-day -day ordinary things. And he says, this is the kind of persistence that God wants. People that are not going to stop coming until God answers. Every moment, I mean, you are praying for food and you are still saying, Father, remember what's on my mirror. I still need that thing. I still want to get into school. I still need this. I need this miracle. And you are saying it without ceasing and without stopping. God will move on your behalf and God will do great things on your behalf. God has taught us in scripture how to be persistent in our faith. And I want to insist that this is something that we have to persist in prayer and always saying and always asking until God comes through. Some of the answers to prayer that I see will have taken months. And when you look at it, you say, oh, he has mega faith. It just happens like that. It doesn't happen many times like that. I wish it did. It doesn't happen just like that. Sometimes I'll be here in this house. I'll be calling on the name of the Lord for a long time. I'll be coming and sometimes I'll just come here and I say, Father, I don't even know what to tell you about this situation. But I'm not moving until you do this. And I'll come, I'll find sometimes a minute, and I'll walk inside this building, and I'll just say, Father, I just pray that you're going to do this for us. And God shows up. Prayer is always answered. God answers prayer. If you're looking for a spouse and asking God, don't, don't, don't buy into the five-minute kind of deal. If you, if you want a marriage that is going to last, I want you to know you have to last in prayer. You have to go down, kneel down, trust God, pray. And be patient until God answers. If you want a quick thing, microwave, I want you to know microwave food is good, but after eating it at some time, you, you, you fish, have no taste for it. If you want something from God, it will take a process and it's going to be something that you have to, to, to pray for and sweat for in prayer. Number three, one of the other catalysts also is confession. Knowing how to confess during your time of prayer. Romans chapter 10 verse 8 the Bible says, but what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. That word, he says, is in you and it's near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. And uh, yeah, th that is the word we proclaim. That is the message of faith. The message of faith, the message of faith is in your heart and in your mouth. It's in your mouth and in your heart. The message of faith is in your mouth and in your heart. And I was explaining here the other day that when we confess the word of God with our mouths, what we are doing is we are speaking it to our hearts. It is one thing to read the word of God. What that does is it touches and changes your heart. When you read it, yes, you hear it, but I want you to know that you never get to get faith in your heart until you start speaking the word of God to yourself. It is when you speak the word of God to yourself. Have you ever tried to tape yourself speaking? Many of you have good phones. Just do an exercise this week. Press on record, speak, and then listen to what you'll be hearing. That sounds like a different person from how you hear yourself. Amen? We actually hear ourselves on the inside very different. And so when we speak to ourselves the word of God, we get it. And it actually it moves. 
into our hearts. It comes from the head to our hearts. When we speak it to ourselves, our spirit imbibes the word. It's engrafted in our spirit. That is the process of building faith in our hearts. Confessing the word of God to ourselves is labor. It's the work of faith. It is the fight of faith. And we need to continually confess God's words to ourselves. Amen? It is important. It is not the, the, the confess and get it kind of message. It is not negative. It is important. When you confess the word of God in the beginning, it looks like you are lying. And you start telling people, I am believing God for such and such in my life. People will laugh at you. Some of you, when you told somebody, I am believing God that one of these days I'll fly in a plane and I'll go to America, people laughed. You, of all people. I mean, they couldn't believe what they were hearing. But you kept saying it until you believed it. And then you asked, how do people go to America? I know you didn't just one day stumble on a green card and say, oh, man, this is a green card. And then you pick it. It has my name. That is not how it happened. There is something you had. Then you spoke that thing to yourself. Then when you spoke it to yourself, you believed it. And then because you believed it, now you went to the embassy and you started pursuing. Now, this is where the difference is. There are so many people confessing. There are so many people saying. They are not seeing any results and they give up. Why? Because they have not yet built the engine on the inside that produces results. When we speak the word of faith from our spirits, it will always produce results. But in the beginning and most of our confession, it is putting the word of faith in our hearts that we can produce it in the future. Confession has two parts. There is a first part of putting the word inside. The second part is speaking it into being. And many of us are in the first part, but we want the results of the second part. Let me give you a good example. My brother, Shem, may be having a very good vehicle out there that has, when he walks out and presses on something, all the doors open up. And it makes very nice sounds. And I look at him and ask, is, you that, is it you that did that? And he says, yes, on this. This is the thing. And so I look at him and say, you know what? That thing, what do you call that thing? And he says, this is a, an automatic car, a door, a car door opener. And I'll say, oh, okay. Then I'll go to the stores and ask, do you have an automatic car door opener? And they'll say, yes, we have it. How much is it? $200. And I'll say, well, give it to me. Okay? I have it. What I don't have is a car. I don't have the car. And so... I'll just wait. When he's walking out next time, we walk out. He presses his. A car opens. When I press mine, nothing happens. You know why? Because the thing I have here is communicating to something else that is not there. And so when you start confessing the word, you are building something on the inside. That's why some people will confess it, it will happen. Some people confess it, it doesn't happen because they don't have the car, they just have the remote. It's like a thermostat. You walk in here and look at that thermostat and say, wow, that thing is that controls all the temperature. And then you go at home and you buy the thing and take it home to your village and tell them, listen, you don't need anything else. Once you have this thing in the house, just put it in the wall. And then all you have to do is take it to 50. And then all, everything will work. Now, the thing works. The thing works. It is sending a signal. But there is no engine. There is no, nothing to produce results. And that is why many of us, our confession has no power because there is nothing stored on the inside. You have to do the labor of confessing the word until the word you confess builds something on the inside, builds the substance that is called faith, then the faith is a substance we hope of the things we hope for, then when we confess that faith will build something that is tangible. Does that make sense? And so the confession that you have, you have to understand what stage of confession you are in. When you begin confessing today, don't expect that you'll confess today, then it happens. 
Just because you saw somebody else confess, it happened, you would say, ah, man, that is all I need. You have to build it. You have to speak sometimes, sometimes speak to yourself and say, I see myself driving a car that I don't have to pay every month for. I see myself not sending bills, not sending checks to other companies. And I see myself just keeping my whole check to myself. And so you have to keep confessing that. I shall be a lender and not a borrower. You keep saying that until it builds something on the inside, until your insides are well built. When they are well built like that, then when you speak the word of God, God will bring it to pass and your faith is going to bear fruit. Amen. And so why confession didn't work for a lot of people is because they started confessing. The devil came up and said, aren't you lying? Aren't you lying? The Bible says, let the weak say they are strong. What does that mean? That means that I am weak. It means that actually the fact is I am weak. But the, because God is inside of me and I'm not by myself, I have the authority and the integrity to say I am strong because the Bible says I am strong. And so I can confess today in my physical form of weakness, I can confess that I am strong and God will take me to the strength that is there. When God spoke things into being, they happened because faith was within. For us, we have to confess the word of God because the word is in our mouth and then in our heart. We speak it in our mouth, then it comes into our heart. You speak it in your mouth, then it comes to your heart. That I will be the top and not the bottom. I'll be blessed in the city and out of the city. I'll speak that until I know I am blessed. Even when I'm struggling today, I'll look at my situation, my circumstances. I'll be able to say, I know I am blessed. One of the things I told my wife, and I, I've shared that here before, is that I one day just told her, you have seen all my suits. I didn't have many. You have seen everything I own in this world. I have no secret property. So, and it wasn't much. And I, I mean, I just wanted to be honest with her. She, you know, I, wanted, I didn't want to deceive her. I wanted her to know what she's getting into. So I told her everything. But I told her that God has blessed my, my life. My life is blessed. She remembers those words. My life is blessed. It's not that I woke up in the morning and I read somewhere, somebody said that they are blessed and they were blessed. No, I had confessed it in my heart. I used to preach and stop in the midst of preaching. And I, told, I used to tell people, listen, watch my life. The end of my life is going to be prosperity. God is going to take me places. And that time they are looking at me. I'm wondering, are they even getting it? But I am at least getting it. And so God is taking me places. I'm on a journey. I still confess it. I'll still say it because I know I've not accomplished anything. I'll still keep going until I get where I'm going. I want you to know that confession builds something on the inside. Don't stop it. Even if the enemy challenges you, don't stop your confession. Keep the confession of your faith because that is a victory. And as you confess, you are building the faith inside your heart. And when you speak, that faith is built. When you speak things, God is going to accomplish them in your life. A desire, when it's combined with the word of God, builds faith within the heart. And when you confess what God has spoken to you, then great things happen inside somebody's life. Amen? Hallelujah. So we are going to be people of confession. We are going to be people that actually are going to be confessing what God has spoken to us. And lastly, the last catalyst is corresponding action. Taking action that corresponds to the confession of our faith. Taking action that corresponds to the vision. This is where many, many people fail. Many people fail to make the confession, but a lot of people fail to, make, to take action. Faith is not a matter of mouth and words. Faith is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the heart. Faith is not a matter of memorizing some scriptures and quoting those scriptures. I've seen quotas of scriptures that are broke. I've seen people quote scriptures when they have nothing to pay for something and it's not working. You don't go to a, a public transportation, especially those of you know what I'm talking about, and you start telling the tout, the matatu person, you start telling them, the Bible says, uh, hallelujah. They are going to kick you out. They are going to give you a 10 shilling beating. 
and kick you out. That is, you have to pay them. When it's time for you to pay, you have to pay them. You can't go to an airline today and start confessing to them. You have, you know, they want to see something. And, and that's why our faith has to actually bear results. Our faith has to actually bring results to the table and be, bring some, some, some stuff to the table that is tangible and that can be seen. And my challenge to you this morning is take action that corresponds to your vision. If your vision is to get into a school, don't tell me you have a vision for getting into a school and all you are doing is praying, confessing you've never gone to a school to ask. And no manager is going to come and knock you on your door and ask you, hey, is your name Jane? We are looking for you to come for a job. That will not happen. Amen? Someone will say, oh, even God feeds the birds of the air. They never dig. They never farm. Have you, found, have you looked at them flying? God never brings worms to their nests. They have to go out and look for the worms. Yes, he feeds them, but they have to fly. They have to scratch the ground and find the fat worm so that they can be fed. And so don't, don't go with a spiritual kind of negative thing and lay back and say, God will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory, yet you're not stretching your faith. You have to do something with your life. There has to be corresponding action that goes to the, to, with the vision of the things that you have in your life. There has to be corresponding action. You have to wake up and say, I will do this because I have faith. I will do this and this thing is going to accomplish things in my life. Amen. And one of the things that I want you to know is you have to study. Study for what you want. If you are looking for a school, go online. Type schools. If it's nursing, nursing school, if it's a vision, a vision schools. And find them. Spend hours. Do your research. Find somebody who has gone to that school. Find somebody who is doing it already. Ask them, how do I get from here to there? Do your research. Many of us do not research. You are just saying, I'm praying about it. And you are praying about it this year. You are praying about it next year. Sometimes you, ha you have to say no to a shift and say no because I'm doing research. There is a research I'm doing because I need to move from where I am to go to the next level. And that is where I want to challenge all of us. Some of you are very, very high uh, to some level. You are very, very high in your, in your place of work, in your place of, in your profession, compared to the people you fellowship with. And so you feel, so and so, they are doing well, and they are not exactly where I am. So and so, they are doing well, and they are not in such and such a place. So you actually are settled because of where, actually, you, you are looking at your friends, and you think, I'm settled because of where I am. I want to challenge you. God has more for each one of us. If you think this is it about the church, you are wrong. I have a vision of going farther and faster than ever before. This is not it about our faith. This is not it about how strong you are going to be in your faith. God is taking us places. And I don't want us to be complacent about our future. I want us to wake up, arise, have a vision, and challenge ourselves to accomplish that vision. And so I want to challenge you, today, today in the evening, before you, you get to bed. And if you get to bed and remember this, get up and write down a vision for your life. Even if your vision is going to be, I'm writing a vision for writing a vision for my life tomorrow, write a vision for that. But do not hit your bed tonight before you write a vision down. That is the only way you can activate your faith so that your faith is going to bear action. Results are not going to come without an active challenge from your own self about your faith. And when you write down your wishes, put dates on them. When you put dates on them, you are going to come up with a plan. If I'm going to have accomplished this by this time, my plan to do that is A, B, C, D. Have a clear plan. Do your research very well. Make informed decisions. Because you may end up saving time and saving resources if you do your research well. And that is the way of faith. That is a very spiritual message I just shared with you this morning. One of the most spiritual messages that you actually hear from me. It is deep. Amen? If you want deeper things, that is the deepest you can go. 
that is deeper than anything that you'll ever hear or feel. The last two Sundays we talked up three Sundays we talked about heaven. I'm just talking to you. How do you live on earth before you get there? Some of us are fit for heaven. We are right people to live in heaven. But the thing is, Jesus prayed in John 17. He said, Father, I pray that you keep them in your word, in your earth, in, in, in on earth, in your word. Don't take them out of the world. I wish he said something else like bring them to heaven right now. But he said, keep them on the earth. And so because he prayed, you are going to be on the earth where we pay bills. <laughs> on the earth where we are challenged by the things of life. Where people are going to challenge you. We are on earth. I challenge you to use the power and the actions of faith to move from where you are to go to the next level. Because that is where God is calling you. And that is where God wants to take us. Let's bow our heads and pray. We thank you, our Heavenly Father. And this morning, I've thrown a challenge to the people as you gave it to me. And I bring it to you again, O oh God, that you're going to follow this word inside our hearts. Action steps are going to be made today about this word. That it will energize our prayer lives. It will energize everything that we put our hands to do. It will energize us and transform us and pull us out of laziness and bring us to the mainstream and the highway of activity, miracles, and exploits to the glory of your name. Father, I pray that you will challenge each one of us at our own different levels. Challenge us and bring us to where you want us to come. And Father, we give you praise and we honor you this morning. We adore you this morning. What a mighty God you are. What a loving Father you are. What a gracious Father you are. We give you praise. Hallelujah. If you're here this morning, you want to take a step of faith, a step in faith in the right direction, you need God's help. Some of you are men of faith. Some of you are women of faith. But you want to challenge yourself. Again, to take a step of faith. Just raise up your hand. I will just pray with you this morning. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, we raise our hands to you. Energize our faith again. Reactivate our faith. Lord, help our faith become fiery. That you may find faith in our lives when you come to seeking and looking. Every hand lifted up to you. Lord, is a hand that confesses that we believe you are able to fill us again with strength and power on the inside so that we can live a life of faith that produces results. And so we humble ourselves to you and we ask that you're going to do great and mighty things to the glory of your name. That you will visit us. You will visit us. Each one of us in Jesus' name. I come against the power of doubt and unbelief. The power of the enemy that brings laziness in our hearts. Every discouraging thought, every discouraging experience, I bring it down in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you're going to bring in us, Lord, a spirit of boldness and faith that we can come to you to the, grace, to the throne of grace and mercy to find help for us in the day of trouble. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray, believing and trusting. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you so much. Let's give the Lord a good hand this morning. Amen and amen.